So this is you know, very important geostrategically. The European Union, let's put this up there on the screen, has now agreed to phase out Russian oil, but is exempting pipeline deliveries. So if you're wondering what that means, it's an interesting question, which is that, <laughs> yeah, they're gonna try and phase out Russian oil over the last two years. However, they are making an exemption for pipeline oil, specifically a concession to Hungary, which has been buying actually Russian oil very, very cheaply um, and has been actually kind of a boon to that country, which itself is kind of throwing a wrench in terms of how the entire EU is looking at this. So what the EU has agreed is that seaborne deliveries of Russian oil within months will be phased out. Pipelines will continue to flow. Now, several countries, including Hungary, Germany, and others, will get extensions or exemptions for this Russian oil. So is it a true embargo? No, that's the answer. I think what's kind of fascinating is that they find themselves just between a rock and a hard place. And we've talked about here, Germany decommissioned all of its nuclear plants or had uh, plans to do so. They dramatically increased their reliance on Nord Stream 2 and on Russian oil and gas. Now you have not only Russian oil, the people need to remember this, it's not just that Russia produces a tremendous amount of oil, they also refine a tremendous amount of petroleum product. Mm. And so they were getting a ton of refined product, both in diesel and in terms of gas from Russia. So when you have that, you're getting cut off not only from the product, but from the actual infrastructure that deals with all this. And as you phase out, that's exactly why we have such high gas prices, high diesel prices, and all sort of crazy supply stuff, which is happening here in America. America, and Latin America, India, China, all over the world. I think what it really does point is that the EU remains in one of position where, yes, they want to do something. They want to take the maximalist position, but they just simply can't for an economic and energy reality. I mean, look, they're going to try and build new LNG terminals so that U.S. LNG can go over. That stuff takes a long time. And in the interim, you're in this crazy period where the European Union and Germany and others are effectively saying that Russia is a pariah state, you know, not welcome the community of nations, and they're doing billions of dollars of trade with them per day in yeah. terms of energy. So. A colossal really just, it's a cluster, I think, is the only way to describe it. And I, I really can't blame the Hungarians. No, I don't. Because, I mean, I don't Orban really said yeah. that, and I'm no fan of his, but um, a faster phase out would be like dropping a nuclear bomb on the Hungarian economy. Yeah. And listen, I don't, I mean, that's, I'm sure, a bit of an overstatement, but I have no doubt that it would be devastating consequences. And so I can't blame them whatsoever for saying, like, we're not ready to go all the way with you on this one. Not to mention, I mean, I have a lot of reluctance about the just all-out economic warfare that has been declared on Russia, which is unlikely to end even whenever this war does end. I mean, Sagar, would you have ever thought, even as we recognize, like, is it a full embargo? No, there's all mm -hmm. these carbon. If it comes in a pipeline, then that's okay. But would you have ever thought at the beginning of this that they would no. even go this far? No. no. I mean, no. I, it's so... I just always have to remind us, back at the beginning when we were like, if they do the swift banking sanctions, that would be crazy. And how far beyond that we have already gone is really, truly extraordinary. You know, in terms of how this uh, will impact Russia, they, because of rising prices, they have actually continued to earn the same amount of money from fossil fuel sales as they did before the invasion, um, even with this partial ban on oil, you know, that'll be phased in over time with the EU. Moscow can uh, lean more heavily on Asia to buy their oil, buy their product to help backstop some of the losses. It's still gonna be a hit to their economy though. There's no doubt about it. What they said in this article is to find buyers with enough appetite to replace the EU market is going to be extremely difficult. And also, you can't just like flip a switch. You've got to reconfigure the entire energy export system and the attendant infrastructure, which is a major, major project in and of itself. So um, this will bite. There's no doubt about it, the Russian economy. Um, but they do have some mechanisms to try to ease just how painful this will be. Yeah, for look, them. if China's going to buy the oil, they're the number one importer of oil in the world. And if you think that the Indians and the Chinese aren't going to take cheaper oil than the global market, then I don't really know what to tell you. They clearly are going to do that. Right. And the other problem is to look, in terms of defense spending, this gets back to what we were saying earlier. Put this up there on the screen from Politico EU. I mean, this is the stuff that doesn't penetrate our media at all. The German government has now agreed to spend $100 billion on new defense spending. Oh, great. 
What's the subhead say? The special fund will be used to revamp the army, but does not commit to spending 2% of GDP on defense every year. And this is what drives me absolutely insane, which is that when you look at what they are saying, their new investment is gonna buy 100 billion worth of US F-35s. Okay, cool. But they refuse to enshrine in their constitution what they had pledged to do whenever this entire conflict broke out and actually just meet their NATO obligations for defense spending. And it's just so obvious that the opposition party and even the center right are unable to get this enshrined in legislation. Here's what their spin is. They're like, well, some years we'll spend over and on your years we'll spend under and eventually it will we'll average down to two. Yeah, okay, maybe. Doing. I don't believe you. There's no reason to believe you in the post Cold War era. They have never once able to step up and actually meet their obligations. Remember that chart that I put in my monologue, I think a couple of weeks ago, just about how much we outstrip the rest of Europe? It's insanity. I mean, we we are outstripping the European Union by eightfold, the Germans by like 16-fold, the UK by 15-fold in terms of just the amount of money and arms that we have spent over to Ukraine. Germany is not that far away from Russia. They have actually fought wars with each other twice in the last, or more than that actually, in the last couple of hundred years. They have every incentive in the world to actually pay for their own defense, except that we pay for it. That That's what just absolutely gets me. And in terms of the sacrifice and all that they're willing to make, no, it's, it's BS. Now, listen, if I was German, I wouldn't either. I'd be like, I don't want to cut myself off from all of this energy, but they talk a huge game about the existential threat to Europe and why America and NATO is so important, but they don't want to sacrifice. They want cheap oil like everybody else. So they refuse to spend the amount of money that they actually should be spending. You know, this is a very prosperous country. Last time I checked, one of the juggernauts inside of the European Union and then, you know, they want their cheap gas and their oil because I think this is what now what's happening. I think people are really starting to grapple with, Crystal, that, you know, I'm doing my monologue on gas. I know it's a meme, again, but gas here is 460 a gallon, okay? Over there, it's even higher in terms of whatever the liter petrol uh, price is in Europe. They are now recognizing they're gonna have to live with this for years. And their economies, I mean, at the very least, aren't gonna grow and possibly could contract as a result of this. So we're now seeing like what the long period of this supply crunch and all of the insanity with COVID and all that is wreaking on people. And actually a lot of these states are in, this is, it's no surprise in a long winded way of saying why all, the German chancellor is one of those people who's pushing very hard for peace. They need this thing to come to an end, but there is no current indication that that's happening. And a lot of us are gonna suffer as hmm. a result. Yeah, I mean, this is all part of truly a, a sort of global realignment and a new order, mm -hmm. uh, post-Cold War, post, uh, you know, unipolar world where, yeah, the Europeans, I mean, Russia has certainly forced the Europeans to do a complete rethink of what their security status looks like, what their energy situation looks like. You see this with, you know, Finland and Sweden, both wanting to join NATO at this point. So they have sort of forced the hand of the Europeans at this point. You know, one other thing that I wanted to update on is we had talked a while back about, remember there were some overtures to Venezuela? Yes. And, yeah. you know, to try to, okay, well, yeah, you know. It hasn't worked out. Yeah, we're taking Russia yeah. off the table. Maybe we can get Venezuelan oil back in. There was actually actually some uh, movement on that that we kind of missed last week, which is the Biden administration announced that they would slightly loosen those crippling economic sanctions on Venezuela's government. They're allowing Chevron, which was the last major American oil company with significant operations in Venezuela. They're allowing them to uh, negotiate again and have dialogue with the government. Under current sanctions, Chevron was prohibited from doing business with the Venezuelan government at all. is only allowed to carry on essential maintenance work. They also removed sanctions on uh, a former Venezuelan state oil official and nephew of the first lady. So it seems like all of this is done to try to sweeten the, the pot a little bit, to potentially, eventually, 
get us back to some sort of a workable relationship with Venezuela. But it's it's a small change in the posture, and I think we're a long way for any, from any real I, resolution. I absolutely think we should do that. Unfortunately, I've, I've said this before, but part of the problem with infrastructure is, and I've looked into this, is that Venezuela has a specific type of, it's called like extra heavy crude or something. It's harder to refine. So the problem is that because we've been cut off from the system for so long, it's harder to refine, um, and it's not that easy to just get things Their spinning. Their oil but, infrastructure yeah. has also really exactly. significantly Severely decayed over the past number their of years. Their nationalization scheme and all that was a disaster, really, for their infrastructure. And so their inability in order to export oil, uh, and on top of, obviously, Western sanctions have made it so that they, anyway, they can't plug the gap. There's only one country in the world that can do it right now. It's called Saudi Arabia. So, you know, they just don't want to help us out. And yet we still spend them $100 billion worth of uh, weapons every year. So somebody can go and riddle me that. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible possible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.